The Evil Late Show Nightly by John S. Argetsinger. Ha ha ha. <clears throat> the phone call had come from Lester. The governor had been found dead in the mansion early that morning. Neck serrated and lacking what one would presume a thick coating of blood, almost as if it had been cauterized. Immediately, Kurt thought about Naomi, found the same way in February. Kurt was stumbling, trying to find the words, his silent speaking leagues <clears throat> to a chapter they had all thought they had put to rest. The governor had been swarming in heat and getting slimed in the press and mass, his wife and children astray in a highly publicized divorce with his wife marrying into a Sami community and granted asylum by the Norwegian government. The tone of Lester's voice had been somber. He had just began to feel at ease and now the dice came out once more. Aside from two goons and the lieutenant governor, nobody was aware of the details surrounding the governor's death. They were scurrying like army ants to cover up the nature of the death citing another state of panic currently not deemed necessary. It came in through the speakers like liquid plumber at around 11 a.m. Washington State Governor reported dead as of this morning. Officials have cited it in aneurysm. Kurt turned the radio off, picking a cigarette out of the ashtray. He thought of Lester. He had called from a burner. Because of his rank in the military, in time served as a Green Beret, Cobain figured he was the last person the goons would end up fucking with. Even Lester had log files. Kurt found it possible that the cabinet could lay the blame on Lester if they tunneled deep enough and came out the other side. Thirteen years he had worked the grounds. Cobain, he knew the press could easily nail him hail him as a savage jackal. You could tell the story about a murdering Indian to the press for lemonade stand prices. This was the abscessed American conscience in action. Kurt had been sleeping through the alarm, drifting in and out of consciousness. Suddenly, a headline came sifting over the radio. A human skull was found this morning by a German tourist containing a removed dental palate. The skull was found at the site of Bruce Lee's grave at Lakeview Cemetery. You hear that, Michelle? Kurt yawned. She replied, I smell bullshit. Kurt lifted the toilet seat. Exactly, he replied. Immediately, he tied the skull in with the missing head of the governor. Horace, he thought. He could see his long white hair standing astute and eyes boring right through the soul. Kurt stepped outside to grab the paper. Upon pulling it from the orange plastic bag, he was surprised to find a note sealed in red wax labeled Inspector Cobain. Kurt curiously stared, stared at the note, preferring to smoke a spliff before opening it. Finally, he tapped out the roach and got on with it. Anxiety a slow crawl around the track. The note read, Dear Inspector Cobain, We are living with unwanted guests on land which is barely ours. Help us reclaim our land and help us clean up our water. Bring us the scalp of Horace Guterres, and your services will be paid in full. We have leads. We'll discuss if you should agree to our needs. Lester speaks highly of you. Sincere, sincerely, Donna Baptiste, Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. The land Donna spoke of was land desecrated in the name of the Manhattan Project and the plutonium from the B reactor created the plutonium for the bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The plant depended on the Columbia River's cool water to control the temperature of the reactors. This was drained into the river. It was now a ghostly relic of the past where toxins still slowly bled into the soil. Kurt speculated, the coffee juicing up his mind. 
What was Horace doing out there? What was his connection with the indigenous? Why had they turned to him? Time would tell. Lester's phone had been unattended for days. Cobain was quite sure that he was, Lester was ghosting him as it was in his best interest. Lester had a daughter he adored and after the tragic death of his wife to throat cancer, he treated their relationship with the special emotion brought out by nobody else. Kurt put it to rest, taking his Chevy Sprint over to Jimmy the Greek for an oil change likely the only mechanic possessing backbone in the whole city. With Jimmy, there wasn't any bullshit, and a deal was a deal. Kurt had taken the bait on heading to Hanford. What did he have to lose? He had a connection with Horace that was possessed by nobody else. It was his responsibility as a man of his word, an ally of Lester's, to look into the matters at hand. Donna had sounded like a wise but gruff woman over the telephone. He was to meet her in Ridgeland to discuss matters. Like most act- activists, she feared surveillance. So much so it had set her in the mental hospital many times over, convinced she was being bugged by the government. A quote came to Kurt's mind. Paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. A psychotic is someone who's someone someone who's just found out what's going on. William S. Burroughs. It was a five-hour drive to Richland, known in the as the Windy City and City of the Bombers. Richland was formerly used as a salmon hub by the Wanapum, Yakima, and Walla Walla tribes. Lewis and Clark are said to have passed through it in 1805. The city had been used like a tampon of the government, with each war causing peaks and craters running along side American plutonium. The Hanford reactors were the largest and most widely used reactors in formulating plutonium for atomic bombs. Somewhere, somehow, in some way, the native tribes in the area had not given up on fighting for clean water. The last batch of plutonium was said to have been made on the site in 1987. And since closing down for good, Hanford had been undergoing a seemingly never-ending cleanup. (coughs) The town had that haunted good old boy energy with visions of segregated bathrooms, Coca-Cola, Lucky Strike cigarettes, oversized lollipops, and beehive hairdos. Kurt drove over to the gas station to pick up a slice, two packs of Winston's, and a six-pack of Olympia beer. Through his rearview mirror, he saw a white Ford Taurus with the for the second time he caught a glimpse of the government plates in the middle of the bull bar so Donna wasn't so paranoid after all Native American activism came with the government surveillance as a prepackaged deal Kurt stuck his arm out the window waving at the car in a passive aggressive way of saying fuck you to his hunch his hunch was correct he was almost certain of it Horace was working with the government. He headed back to the hotel, knowing his room could have potentially been bugged. All in all, all, in all it made cracking open that first beer all the more of a ceremony. The white car veered off his trail, escorting him all the way back to his hotel. Because of the quickness in the government car following him, it was a certain summon in the tribal council, summon at the top, He had passed the info on to agents, a snitch. Kurt despised snitches. It reminded him too much of his days as an ARC agent, where his work often broke apart families and couples he felt affection for, guilty and non-guilty alike. Kurt opened his moleskin and set it to work, reviewing his research completed on the Hanford and Richland sites. The government, native peoples, and now Horace and another division of government 
had all taken their stake and laid their claim on the areas near the Columbia River, still being cleansed of its waste from the B reactor alone. The amount of fresh, pristine river water tarnished by the plant was enough to make the Italian ironized Cody and the commercial cry all over again. <clears throat> Kurt felt stranded. Had he made a mistake, had he f- felt he felt naked and exposed? He had just gotten dressed and was enjoying his morning coffee. He was set to meet Donna at Denny's at 8.30 a.m. With it being a Monday, Kurt figured it would be mostly deserted. He put on his vertical shoulder holster and headed out the door, feeling as if he was treading water and naked on a, on a church floor. He walked into Denny, sighting Donna immediately, sitting next to the front door where she could monitor patrons entering and also make her own exit should it be deemed necessary. Smart cookie, he thought. After a brief introduction, Donna got right to it, providing information on recent happenings in the area. Donna reported to Kurt that a warehouse had been constructed and a restricted access of the vicinity of the ghost town of Hanford. Tribal scouts had recently returned with evidence talking dressed in a suit in front of a warehouse with him with human hands and legs but a head similar to an anteater without fur as the site was monitored at night they were not able to provide a picture what they did declare was evident of a craft being parked within the warehouse Furthermore, a rancher in Hartford was discovering his cattle, headless, coinciding with the strange light on the ground, moving at an extreme rate of speed. His wife and children were deeply disturbed. Kurt was confused as to why he was there. What power did he have to put a stop to any of this? This was a top secret restricted area with no different than Area 51. He inquired, pressing Donna to reason with him as the purpose of him coming all the way out to Richland. Donna took a deep breath, sighing and ashing her cigarette. Creighton contacted me. He had a vision coinciding with the evidence gathered by the scouts. A piece I've been withholding is that Horace Gutierrez has been spotted by our scouts. We believe that these two entities are still polluting the river. We have these to provide you with. Donna produced a manila folder con- containing images of chemicals being disregarded in the river. We believe there is a micro-plutonium reactor somewhere on the new top-secret site. Kurt took a sip of his lukewarm coffee, followed by a long, soothing drag on his cigarette. Kurt inquired further, Am I dealing with extraterrestrials or shapeshifters? Donna replied, Both. Kurt was now in the thick of it. He had warned Donna that he was not able to stay long. This was of no bother, however. She had handed him a second folder containing maps and background surveillance information, including photographs of Horace and several of his road dogs inhabiting a warehouse facility equipped with lofts in the Soto district back in Seattle. The extraterrestrials would continue their work with government as long as the skinwalkers were along for the ride. Kurt came to surmise that the extraterrestrials were more docile than one might imagine. They seemed to have a different connection with the government than they did with the skinwalkers. Kurt was learning the shapeshifters were the muscle behind the entire operation. The ETs could not operate without the shapeshifters, something Kurt was beginning to understand. Had it been that in the UFO sightings worldwide that skinwalkers were in cahoots with alien life forms, it was a huge question mark growing, question mark growing like a tumor inside his giant cranium. 
throughout history and say some on canyon walls, the Nazca lines of Peru, Atlantis. The agents certainly did not understand UFO engineering well enough to harness it on their own. They needed the elements of ETs and muscle of the skinwalkers working in their favor. Kurt took all his frustration and put the warehouse in Soto on the top of his priority list. He had hit the main line, realizing the, that Horace and had left Olympia after murdering Governor Hensley during his setup in Seattle, set, and set up shop in Seattle. Kurt was in Seattle was Kurt's territory, and he had been had far more resources there. He felt good about living Richland. The agent escorting him out of town on his back to Seattle, where he was sure to attract more attention. He didn't fear for it. He knew every bus line by the back of his hand and in order to evade agents on his tail. He knew exactly who would he would call on to take care of the Skinwalker compound. It would be, it had up to 25 lofts and Kurt laughed to himself in the car, flicking his roach out the window. The government might have had skinwalkers protecting their operation, but they didn't have Black Butterfly, also known as Black Beauty, also known as 99 Knives, AKA Silver Fox at their disposal. A Vietnam veteran with a heart of gold and a brain sharper than a razor. Kurt could see him now flexing his mouth, his muscles at age 72 with a non-filtered cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I owe my health to tobacco. He loved drinking Yukon Jack, and he could get a kiss from any passing female with a few short words of charm. When Kurt returned to Michelle's, she drew him a hot bath and joined him in the bathroom reading the garbage magazines from the checkout aisle. Forever following the royal family and actors like alike, given her experience in drama courses in years prior, he felt at home taking in the therapeutic oils and nipping on a piss cold Olympia. The trip to Richland had been successful in providing him a further documentation on the inner workings of things he wished in truth he did not have to know. He wasn't the miracle worker everyone expected him to be. He was a human with a heart, often troubled by vivid memories, nights awakening Michelle screaming in his sleep and waking up in a cold sweat with a thundering heart rate. He planned on getting in touch with Black Butterfly the following day, hoping to catch him before he set to drinking harder and harder with every passing hour. <clears throat> he never got tanked working jobs, however. He still needed a repu reputable reputation to be upheld. He had a reputable reputation to be upheld. In the 1970s, he had ran a laundromat and worked for Sears. He was forever proud of that. But he helped build Money Trees, a payday loan company that kept happy, kept Papa happy and the poor looking for rice in the vacuum cleaner bag. The following morning, he contacted Alex to meet him at 13 Coins for lunch. Normally, Alex got his meals and a drink at the turf, a bar where he had his checks cashed. His other haunt was Joe's. Kobe needed him, him away from listening ears. Besides, Silver Fox knew everyone. This was serious business. They needed to hash out who... And, and see if the Silver Fox would agree to it. He was an expert in explosives, although Kenny was just a man to provide them. Kurt jumped on the 26 bus and made his way toward a connection and then jumped on the 574, which would take him to SeaTac. Alex had beaten him, taking him in, ta sitting in the high leather-backed booth, sipping a Manhattan. 
He was famished and ordered a burger and fries, requesting a fried egg on his burger. Silver Fox piped up. So we here to chew the fat or this business. Kurt began to getting him up to speed from his dead cat to flashbangs and his last sightings of Horace being bought, brought aboard the giant ship over Seattle, now regarded by locals as the Death Star. True materialization of what had been deemed science fiction since Isaac Asimov. Silver Fox remained quiet, ashing his camel nut filter and devouring every last word. He loved being privy to the true workings behind the gears, a classic conspiracy theorist for which Kurt loved him and took most from their friendship. Alex drove Kurt home in his cherry Oldsmobile Cutlass, steering Steely Dan on the radio. It was mid, it was mid afternoon, and when he returned home, he received a page from Creighton. Creighton called him and asked what the scoop was. Creighton simply replied, "We need to talk." He didn't sound his normal, relaxed self. There seemed to be a certain level of urgency. Kurt had planned on getting him and getting in touch with him. With no heat on him, he made Michelle a cup of tea and delivered it to her bedside. She was not feeling well. Cobain dumped, jumped in the Chevy Sprint and headed toward Beacon Hill. Upon his arrival, Creighton insisted they take a walk. Finally, as they reached 15th Avenue South, he began to voice his concerns. <clears throat> Creighton, <clears throat> Creighton began to describe almost word for word where Donna had provided with Kurt on paper. <clears throat> he too knew what Kurt had planned. The explosives will not be enough on their own. That's why you're here. I need you to take these and guard them at all costs until you plant your seeds. He pulled a medicine red piece of felt from his jacket pocket, handing it to Kurt. Kurt unwrapped it carefully. Wrapped up in the felt was a two large sized quartz crystals. These are from Peru, Creighton explained. They must each be applied to the plastic explosives. He continued, they are from a shaman in my youth, back when I was still studying. He told me one day I would need them. Last night, we came to me in a dream and showed me the events to come. He told me to give them to you. Kurt remained quiet, honored and concerned all at once. It was a big responsibility to be caring for such strong medicine. Creighton apologized for seeming uptight. Carried these stones with, I have carried these stones with me since I was your age. You must give me your word you will take care of them and guard them with your life until you can successfully put them in with the bleach bottles I know you're planning on stuffing with C4. Still, Kurt remained silent. He was aghast, honored, and perplexed all at once. Finally, he spoke. I'm forever in your good graces, my friend. I'm speechless with hope and protection. You exude a love, exude a love seldom found in most people. I thank you for always looking after me. Creighton replied, The unseen world is accessible by prayer, as you know. All is a circle. Kurt replied, Indeed, the point driving home. Kurt spent the next couple of hours of the fever, dreams embryonic and mystifying, lucid visions of car chases, being burned alive, dying at sea. It was all horror. Finally, he was he sweated all out, arising to meet a new day, confidence waning. After breakfast, he made a telephone call to Kenny, who invited him over, Tad blasting on the stereo in the background and sounding as if he had just railed half a gram of speed. When Kurt arrived, he heard Kenny holler through the door, Doors open if you're not a cop, otherwise I wouldn't recommend it. Kurt had balls of 
Kenny had balls of steel. He was blasted on when he was blasted on go. Kurt Ender just in the same instant when Kenny set a can of tuna fish to the edge of his lips and took a long salty swill, disregarding the meat into the feed bowl for one of his many army of cats. <clears throat> the space heater running off of a gener- out, generator out back had the whole living room reeking of the ammonia stench from the cat piss the litter box unattended to, and starburst wrappers scattered in a circle around Kenny's favorite armchair, a relic from the 1970s. Kurt took a seat in the theater chair, pulled out of an old movie house, depressing the seat from its upright position. How the hell are you, inquired Kenny. Pupils seething in their own sickening juices, I'm sort of at a stumbling block, to be honest. I'm hoping you can procure a very dark web-esque, some sort of something to take care of a certain somebody and his aunts and his cohort, ex, ex cohorts, and his cohorts. I don't care about a good deal as much as I care about a quality product. Kenny's eyes lit up like the Vegas Strip ablaze with glee. So what are we looking for, Dr. Cobain? Kurt lit a cigarette. Two bricks of C4. Now Kenny got very excited. Turns out I recently became acquainted with a vet who just returned from Bosnia. He's got connections galore for exotic fruits of that nature. Kurt ashed his cigarette on the crumb-covered floor, glancing about the rooms at dead plants and empty candy corn bags burrito wrappers and a giant hot sauce bottle of Valentina half empty and sitting in a sunbeam atop the card table where Kenny kept his paraphernalia. Kurt needed to work out a payment option. He had vittles and cash in an offshore account which he could wire anyone at the slap of his hands. How trusted was the source of the, um, that was, that was, how trusted was the source, he wondered, never knowing the true nature of what Kenny shared. He will pull through, trust me, Cobain. You're in good hands with me. Christ, you've been acquainted now since you were a fucking narc. Your eyes have, your eyes say you're having doubts. Best you set those for, aside for a rainy day. Give me a week. I'll contact you by next Wednesday. Kurt had no idea how long it would take to get the government to comprehend the engineering of the craft and its operation. Was it meant for matters of interplanetary travel or were they simply trying to formulate a new warbird? Time was of the essence. One thing was certain. The government was formulating plutonium once more in exchange for what? For the blueprints of the ship as well as various phases, various test phases. The salmon run was evidence of their damages. What of Horus? He had given his word he would dispose of him, yet that task was seeming more and more out of reach like looking for a needle in a stack of needles. The warehouse, a surely blasphemous notion. The warehouse in Soto had a gallery downstairs with the hallway leading toward the large lofted rooms in which the shapeshifters called home. As they didn't sleep, they indulged themselves in all the late night comforts, watching films while eating boiled meat and corn, potatoes, Some of them isolated with a rattle, slipping into the lower world and seeking answers. Most of them averaged an age of 200 years old. They were highly educated and in human form, came off as extraordinarily eloquent. This This binded quality only furthered their lifespan, able to survive anywhere and with anyone. 
the powers of their mind and spirit glorified like canary diamonds in the snow. These were half-breed shapeshifters selected by Horus. Horus dabbled in black magic and was said to have been trained in voodoo in the 1960s while living in Morris Heights in in the South Bronx under a vicious defector of the Black Panther Party named Chiaka Robinson. Horus lived and breathed evil. His true nature, savage, and his mind and spirit crammed with venom. A truth he finally summarized was a lost cause. Things had already been taken far enough. That this certain he would hear Black Beauty telling him one of their long drunken debates about in one of their long drunken debates about life, the inevitable cop out. Prior to his receiving the plastic explosives, Kurt met with Alex at Bauhaus Cafe, a relic shop, later turned into a Warby Parker. The old record store turned into a high-class boutique. It wouldn't be long before locals didn't even recognize the neighborhood they knew and loved. (sighs) Cranes soon decorated the skyline like leeches, pulling the veins of the city and its oily discharge mixed with the smell of $100 bills. Contractors and gentrification servants of the new vampire order sucking the life and old town charm into vacuum cleaner hose connected to the depths of hell. In the year 2000, the kingdom would be removed from the skyline, replaced by Lumen Field. It was fancy and lacking the neon charm of the green astroturf. All was in disarray for the city of Seattle, Brown Town, the Emerald City, Friattle. With the loss of Councilwoman Tim Was, mentally felt, felt fucked by the nose dick of the law, condom not included, ghastly notions and big business. Alex sat emotionless, his cold-blooded side revving up in RPMs. Kurt had tracked down the custodian of the loft and gallery. He was brought, bought off for cheap. A clammy stack of $500 delivered in a wax-sealed yellow envelope at the Whidbey Island dock. A copy of the keys delivered to Kurt. That night, <clears throat> that night Michelle was going through a box of Kurt's belongings when she discovered several mushrooms inside of a glasses case. You're just sitting on these, she remarked. Kurt replied dryly. I've been waiting for a moment to present itself. She shook her head. The time is now, amigo. We're having... With her having, I don't know what this is. You take them off my hands. She refused. Kurt, I'm very aware how miserable you have been. Let's eat one and go on a walk. After some more prodding, he gave in. He was not sure what he would become of him under the influence of psilocybin after such recent trauma. But Michelle made him feel safe. He chewed the mushroom up and swallowed it with a sip of beer. The two began making their uh, way towards Northwest Fifty Third Street. With the forty-five minutes, within forty-five minutes, their trip began to make a slow, small crawl. They were wandering through the warehouse district of Ballard, laughing at their shadows dancing on the brick walls. This trip was exactly what he needed. This trip was exactly what he needed. The midnight air, maddening and filled with spirits. They laughed like jackals, the fear they felt dissipating, the beads of rain dribbling down their necks, the the beads of rain dribbling down the neck of a mallard in spring twilight. The two of them felt invincible in the damp midnight darkness, walking past RVs and back 
streets, act, back streets lit up from the insides with God knows what going on within. The shrooms were strong and kept them smoking and talking till sunrise. Grief and uh, sadness falling from their minds like a white Christmas. All at the gallery was quiet, the lights off. He couldn't quite dwell, but it looked like there wasn't any, any any work hanging on the walls. It was a perfect time to plant the explosive, but Kurt needed to see for his own conscience who he was actually assassinating and using Alex as the worm. Finally, around 8 p.m., a woman with a red bandana showed up and turned on the lights inside. Shortly after, the men began to show up, each dressed from head to toe as if having just gotten off work. There was a huge variation. UPS drivers, grocery clerks, postal service workers, lawyers, security guards, TSA agents, all seeming to call the Soto Warehouse home. They returned to the back rooms at this time. Kurt sent a page to Alex as a symbol to enter the gallery. 9 p.m. on the dot, the time the custodian usually showed up for his shift. Alex entered into the building with his keys and was immediately faced with the hard-ass working woman in the red bandana. The vest she wore was a dead baby vest known throughout Seattle as the true warriors of the road. After a small tantrum, Alex, dressed in, co- in coveralls, was allowed to carry out with the washing of the commons and bathroom, commons bath in bathrooms, emptying trash and sweeping and mopping common areas. He went forth with nightly tasks as described by the custodian, likely drunk on vino at this hour, on a Friday night. Luckily, the custodian was disorganized and planting C4 in the janitor's closet was easier than stealing chewing tobacco from a spittoon. Alex finished the rounds he had had. In, yeah. The, Alex finished his rounds and then exited the warehouse bidding Rocky good night. He knew she smelled something on him. As soon as the detonators were engaged, it wouldn't mean a goddamn thing. And when when it comes down to it, you can't die. Not yet once you are born, you're obligated to survive at all costs. James Clavell, King Rat. The detonators were set to go off at midnight. Kurt and Alex had moved to the surveillance van several blocks away. 11.45 rolled around, and the two became more and more nervous. Their anxiety, mercury rising like a flat run across Death Valley. The two of them had each gone through a pack of cigarettes and were now smoking butts out of the ashtray. Alex had already gone through a full flask of Yukon Jack, a 100-proof honey-tasting whiskey not made for the faint of heart. Regarded by most in the same vein as old granddad and old crow, the smell of it made Kurt feel like vomiting. Although several blocks away, the explosion thundered like a clap of God. The shockwaves blowing out the shop and car windows three blocks away. The van immediately had a spiderweb crack running across its windshield. In the rearview mirror, he had began to spot a purple hue of light cascading straight heavenward. The charred skeleton reaching seven feet tall had a raven skull the size of an elk complete with horns wrapped in a black cloak. The figure stumbled in the street and collapsed. Immediately after, his body dissolved into ash. Kurt and Alex looked at each other. Get me the hell out of here, Kurt. Oblige. 
seeing the power of the crystals, Horace was weighing heavily on his mind. When he got home, he sprinkled salt on the mix for the mixture from Creighton in the mixture from Creighton around his apartment complex. He felt overwhelmed looking for a Valium in his war chest, grateful he had never flushed them. Black Butterfly had been more than willing to help, refusing payment instead, bartering for Kurt Silver Bracelet. Kurt turned on the Como News and was aghast at their damages. All that was left of the grounds and warehouse were a deep crater. Shockwaves from the explosion had registered all the way down into Tacoma. To reach Horus was to visit the lower world, a land of spirits and mixtures of our reality and the one below. It was advised long ago to stay out of the middle world, place where good spirits were devoured and evil ones preferred to feed on a dimension. That night, Kurt took those Walkman headphones into a dark bedroom, lying flat on his back on the floor. The BPM of the drum beat meant to draw the traveler further into a place where one felt as if one were in a half dream and half awake. Kurt never felt drugs necessary to engage in shamanic practice, for he had learned from an old Inuk the art of going to the moon to communicate with the dead and all other matters in regards for the soul retrieving retrieval to helping one find their power animal. He had not journeyed in years, the last time being when he traveled into his modem to reach the middle world and discovered a great evil. Boardrooms and businesses with yellow teeth, rape, murder. To this day, it still weighed heavily on his conscience. Kurt began to astral project just minutes after laying down with the cassette using the toilet as the doorway into the lower world. After following a root system into the depths, he finally reached the other side, his power animal waiting for him to take him on his journey. He underwent riding on the back of a buffalo traveling over rapidly changing flora and fauna until he came to a white open field of heather blossoms on the shores of a beach that looked like the Arctic, yet had the temperature of an island in the South Pacific. Scattered about the shore sporadically were several dozen old growth yellow cedars. Several hundred yards down the beach, he spotted a fire. The smoke subtle, but the to the trained eye. He began to walk towards that figure, the figure by the fire. When he was about 20 feet away, the being stood up and turned around. It was Horus, long silver hair and eyes which bore right through your soul like a diamond drill bit. So what's a coward like you doing down here? You should be working for me. Kurt shot back. You're killing the river, Horus. You should know as well as I do what fresh water means to nearly every life form on the planet. Water is life. To you, wine and cheese is all that you need to feel satisfied. Horace continued with his strong stance. Some of what you say may be true, yet sometimes we must sacrifice. You're more than versed on Inuk suicide committed by elders. That's what you call sacrifice. Remove the weak, make room for the young. The group becomes stronger. Some things are dead weight. Kurt saw his point, yet didn't feel it relevant. He jousted. What about up there in the middle world? What is the hangar in the, in the Hanford for? Why the ship, the plutonium? It's a bartender. It's a barter with the top secret section of the military. They want to learn how to provide the 
to produce, pilot, and engineer equipment for warfare. The extraterrestrials need components from our planet not readily available to them on their home planet, a.k.a. they cannot mine uranium. If you want a truce, then I'm happy to stop deploying skinwalkers and compromise promise a closure of plutonium site by next month. Horus began to dissipate. I could kill you in your dreams, Cobain. I hope you know that. <clears throat> he was caked in sweat, blood pressure as high as Denali. Horus's last words terrified Kurt. In the act, he found it likely that Creighton had prevented him death his death from weeks on end at this point. With the last skinwalkers blown into smithereens, Kurt could not fathom what would come next. Would Horace keep his word? Likely so. Yet he also dabbled in voodoo aside from shamanic practice. He could not be fully trusted ever, or could he? Was Kurt was Kurt wrong, terrified like an acid trip at a guar show, he soldiered on. There was no way Horace would agree to a truce unless they were near closure of the project, or he full of shit. Inspector Cobain had been working for months without a paycheck living off of his savings. He had gone through as much shit as anyone needed to handle in one lifetime. He longed to be working with a, working a missing persons case at this point or security for some high-class drug dealer who paid in cash. This was pushing him farther and farther into the brink of his own sanity. In truth, he wanted relief. A drive down the 101 with the spliff burning. He needed to blow off steam. He longed for the old gross sequoias hoping to venture um, come summer. Let's venture south. Things with Michelle had gone rocky, Kurt feeling more of a burden than a love. Despite this, she was all he had. Kurt had pushed most of his friends away during his years of heavy drinking and as a narc. The following day, he paged Donna, wanting to share with her his interaction with Horace. He had no idea what was going on in Richland. Yet he felt to see this thing through, he needed to venture south, particularly to make sure Horace kept up his word, hoping to utilize the guidance of the scouts to get him close to the hangar and warehouse. A time of the owl, the pet messenger of death. It was either Horace or Kurt to come out on top yet each wished to avoid bloodshed. Horace had seen what Kurt could do to his crew. The following morning, Kurt arose with the sun, making his way to the grocery store for essentials, water, cigarettes, beer, fruit, Dr. Pepper, assorted junk food, top ramen. He loaded into the sprint and headed south, the landscape opening up into a big sky and sagebrush as far as the eye could see. Kurt's mind was momentarily soothed by the landscape coming back into the reality at hand, wishing to drive straight through Richland and disappear, failure falling to the wayside and losing himself in the notion of the American dream, true freedom. <clears throat> Escape, set free for all of earthly burdens, set free of all earthly burdens, succumbing to the beast within, not yet, not now, that would come later. For his mind raced and he looked, took another valium, slowly soothing his anxiety. The stakes were high and placed their favors on each of them. Kurt knew he had not elected Horace to end the program entirely, but Kurt knew a lowly private eye. But Kurt just in our lowly private eye, 
Yet Donna had offered to pay a large sum should he take care of the plutonium in the river. The government could not be dictated, but he knew the government could not be dictated. He could do nothing more than break up the connection between skinwalkers and ETs alike. The government had far too much muscle and security systems to ever cause a dent in their activities. Yet when it came to Horace, Kurt could wager a certain amount of control. Donna awaited Kurt in front of her trailer, in the yard drinking a Miller Lite and smoking an an overflow next to an overflowing ashtray. She seemed more relaxed than her previous visit, face not so con- congealed and lacquered with paranoia. Kurt's eyes made their way to the chicken coop, blood stains painting the ground like a Jackson Pollock piece. Donna saw his reaction. It's the first time found all 12 of them headless this morning. Horace Kurt thought to himself, Horace wanted to exert his power over Kurt, knowing he would arrive on the, in the following day. Kurt replied, well, don't much, get much more demanded than that, I suppose. Donna came right out with it. Kurt went on to explain his visit the night prior speaking to Horace in the unseen world and to deal with and the deal they had brokered. The truce, the promise of production being completed within a month's time. It was the only deal Horace was willing to negotiate. This was all they had to work with. Donna tried to hide her disappointment. Kurt quickly reading her. It's all Horace was willing to negotiate. It's my thought that he will end his reign of torment until either I or someone else puts some bullets into him. I saw in his eyes during my journey in the lower world, he knows the damage I inflicted on him is irreplaceable. Those 20 something skinwalkers we took down in Seattle left a fucking crater in the ground. The skinwalkers vaporized. Something tells me he wants to walk away for now, head back underground. It's what I sensed in his eyes, fringes of defeat, desperation, sadness. Donna s- studied his every word, going from skeptical to realistic. Kurt had a gift for Donna, for Donna at that 100, two, 100, 223 rounds, packed with Creighton's medicine. He had been busy. Donna took a great pleasure in this, loading her AR-15 magazine with a cigarette in her lip. He remarked, Creighton is making more of these rounds, so no need to be stingy. Nobody will be coming near you for the, this point on. I've seen what we've sa- seen what sacred medicine does to these beings, and it vaporizes them. If they're smart, they will keep a distance. It pleased him to see their feeling safer. She had been living in fear over a year now. Kurt found out that evening Creighton had told her to deliver our, our message to you and that you would be accountable for helping our people. He jokingly told me you were a different kind of white boy. Kurt burst out laughing. Indeed, not many 33-year-old non-native descent would be engaged in shamanic practice. (sighs) For although there were a great deal of white folks attending workshops in the 1970s, not many were ever accepted into the realm of true healers. Something about Kurt's aura attracted Native peoples to him, and something of Native people attracted him to them in return. It was a beautiful bond. At night, as night fell down upon the land, came thunder came tumbling through the mountains from the east. First rain and lightning followed by hail. The hail started off as small as BBs, yet as the minutes passed, the droplets grew in size. Within five minutes, they were the size of baseballs, denting the living hell out of his Chevy Sprint. 
The two of them made a mad dash into the side of Donna's trailer. The storm carried on for another full hour. Cars on the highway trying desperately to make it to an overpass to park beneath. If this ain't a sign, I don't know what it is, Donna remarked. I'm right there with you and I feel like Horace is running down his list of tricks. Have I shared with you his work in the arts of voodoo? Learned from a member expelled in the Black Panther Party, his doctrine not considered sane or justified. This is in itself me. Help explain the headless animals remain headless animals. The notion had Donna's gears working. That makes a hell of a lot more sense. Kurt continued, It's my belief that he passed down some some or all of his this magic to his crew now mostly evaporated. Yet it does not mean there are more of them. Horace was eloquent, an eloquent charmer and wanted to have no issue recruiting skinwalkers. Being that they were half-breeds, they had an easier time of maintaining their human form and controlling their urge to kill. Kurt broke into his six-pack and ended up sleeping on Donna's floor, mind traveling back to years spent on the floors of friends and taking shelters in abandoned cars. Donna had promised to get Kurt in touch with her scouts come morning. Kurt arose at 4 a.m. the next morning, the sun just below the horizon, ready to break free at any moment. This had always been a favorite time of morning. She hated looking back on years spent strung out under pressure to produce evidence and maintain his sanity all at the same time, staying awake for days on end. He was grateful for the degree of normalcy he now engaged in on a daily basis. Kurt folded his blanket and pillow, Donna putting some co- pu- putting on some coffee and pulling out a fifth of Kahlua just the way he liked to take on the day, caffeine and a snort all at once. There came a special coded knock at the door, Donna remarking, come on in, Clayton. The door swung open and there stood a man about five foot four inches, smiling from ear to ear. He extended his hand. My name is Clayton. Donna speaks highly of you. Kurt responded with, caution. He didn't trust any Yakima native that big of with, with that, that big of smile on his face unless he was putting up a front. Something Kurt felt the vibrations of, of immediately. Creighton had taught him well. For good me- measure, he could reach into his memory Rolodex. Trust no one black butterfly would hollow or holler across the street. Clayton would be best described as being slick. After handing Donna an envelope, they bid him on his way. Upon his departure, he gave Kurt a horrible stench of stink eye. When he was gone, Kurt opened up to Donna. I don't like him. Reminds me of vermin, leeches, crabs. Klingon of the highest order. Donna laughed. Oh, don't worry about him. Why waste the energy? Kurt knew she was right, dropping it as it lay, taking a mental note as he was taught by Creighton and Alex alike. Tonight the boys are going to take you out to perform surveillance. I want you to eat a good breakfast. Kurt had no complaints about a free breakfast. From a cupboard she pulled out a his box of variety donuts, giving Kurt a top run his coffee. He felt like he was at, with his Auntie May. Kurt stepped out for a smoke in the fresh morning air. The dew gathered all about the t- t- uh, tall strands of grass, the neighbors enjoying the morning sun, waving back at Kurt. 
despite the nature of his trip, it was soothing to be out of the city. He felt far less stimulated and branched a better connection to his heart and spirit. All was momentarily at peace for just minutes later. Donna appeared outside of the trailer reporting that her scouts had found hordes of belly-up salmon that morning. Kurt felt drop a drop in his spirit quickly back on target for why he had come to Richland once more for the first place. In the first place. Kurt spent the majority of his day napping and chain smoking. He was running low on Valium, and to lay in bed was his sanctuary. Donnie let him use her use her bed and she went on errands. Kurt had Asked her to pick up some kettle and some cranberry juice and limes. This trip would require sedation whenever he could find it. Besides, the benzo withdrawals or pure hell could result in a seizure. Thus, he began to wane himself down. Around 6.30 p.m., the sun was finally falling away into the horizon. Donna's boys were said to show up somewhere between 7 and 9 p.m running on Indian time. Once Kurt got a couple of drinks in him, his hands weren't were tremor-free and as sturdy as the river rocks. He was ready, anxious to get things out of the way, checking multiple times if his forty-five was on its holster. The last thing he wanted to do in this moment was get crocked, sipping vodka out of a shot glass. Another at around around nine thirty the heard the car pull outside the trailer. Donna knew from the V8 engine it was the boys. Let me smudge you, Kurt. Sacred medicine had wandered all the way from, itself away from Kurt. In the passing weeks, she had, he had failed to smudge himself daily. Three members of the ITS would be taking Kurt. Gravely to his disappointment, one of them was Clayton. They had made it out from Don's driveway before he was offering Kurt gum and asking personal questions. Not here for a fucking book report, amigo. Kurt hated the sliminess in his voice and apparent in his gestures. The crew had Gulf War era equipment, including night vision, which Johnny, the driver, utilized acquiring after cutting the headlights. I hope you're ready to go clambering, clambering through Arroyo's kid. He continued, you want a vet, want a vest? We got one extra. Kurt saw it, no bother, leaving himself up to fate. The man had been outfitted with fresh rounds not seeing Kurt's weapon at his side. Kurt pulled his hair into a ponytail. The bumps in the road had him up chucking bits of vodka, a slight hangover keeping him in check. Finally, about a half mile in the distance, they spotted the warehouse and the hangar lit up like Satan's crematorium. Finally, Johnny Edge slightly off the dark track through, and through the truck in the park. Clayton's eyes seemed shifty as he exited the truck as if Johnny took the lead, this man demanding, demanding silence. Clayton was sloppy, equilibrium seeming off, stumbling, likely drunk. Johnny and Bart ignored it, likely the mech Messy bastard's usual M.O. They began climbing their way up through the desert night, a half moon washing out the clouds like bleach. Johnny held up his hand in a fist, crushing to one knee, the other swallowing suit. Johnny whispered to Clayton, beckoning him forward. In a rapid movement, he wrapped his arm around Clayton's neck from behind, setting the silence 45 to his head and pulling the trigger. Immediately, Clayton fell to the form of a wolverine with the stature of a six-foot-tall, 
falling to the ground and squealing in agony like a piglet watching its mother being cooked on the spit. Dead weight, bad energy. We've been onto his nature for weeks and end, hoping to get a messenger. Clayton's body fell forward to the ground as the skinwalkers formed, crumbling into ashes. There was a maddening silence, leaving the three of them with nothing but the tinnitus echoing in their heads. <clears throat> I was onto that motherfucker from day one, remarked Johnny. I have some infrared film to document the plutonium discharge into the river as well as the hangar. I can get you close, but me and Bart aren't going to be in it to win it. At some point this evening, there is even a chance they deploy a security squad somewhere in this area. The threes got to stay as far away as they could, as we can, restoring their prone position, slithering like rattlesnakes bit by bit toward the outskirts of the warehouse and hangar. Why had a skinwalker been working with them? It stuck, stuck like a needle. When close enough, Johnny pulled out the telephoto lens and miniature tripod. Connecting to the camera body and freshly loaded infrared film firing through the chamber with the, the film slot. The pipes marked radioactive were heading straight toward the river. So there it was, a craft similar to the one spotted over Seattle weeks prior and known as the Dust Star by the locals, the warehouse emitting a low frequency hum. As Johnny continued taking photos, Kurt slipped out his 45 silencer and quietly attached it, attached it. He did it slowly, finally resting the gun to Johnny's temple. Johnny ceased with the photographs, slowly setting the camera down in front of him. Kurt spoke, open the back of the camera. I got 50 bucks that says that fucking thing ain't even loaded. Johnny obliged. Kurt's guess proving right. Slowly in the darkness, Johnny reached for a flare. Seconds later, he deployed it with the flare gun, instantly lighting up the sky and sending agents from the hangar clambering their way to the wash where they had hunkered down. Immediately, Johnny stood up, remarking to the sergeant, this is the one, the one you've been looking for. Bart, who had said barely a word all night, remarked, Good riddance. They were all shapeshifters. Kurt felt screwed by the harsh reality of it. His hands now bound in zip cuffs and Kurt's forty-five removed. He saw the outline of Donna in the base of the craft in the hangar. Standing next to none other but Horace Gutierrez. Kurt had been fucked on all sides. Instantly, the... Uh, instantly, the, piece came, the pieces came together. Lester. Lester had sold him out. Likely over gambling debt or some such bullshit. However, Kurt did not disregard him entirely knowing the love he felt for his child. A black cloth was placed over his head, and he was led towards the SUV and given a shot of anesthesia. What becomes of Creighton? The last thing on his mind, slipping into his darkness, slipping into darkness. Kurt awoke to the sounds of the jungle, a clamminess sticking to his skin. The sound of chickens. His wrists were sore but free of bonds. He removed the cloth from over his head, eyes greeted by the sun, scorching his eyelids. In the background of the small bungalow, on a dirt floor, he could hear Tejano and laughter roaring from every street corner. He looked around the room, spotting peyote bulbs and mushrooms in a king-sized pickle jar. There was a man dressed traditionally sitting over him, shaking a rattle in a trance and calling out in 
chant. He scrolled through his memory Rolodex till he found the conversational Spanish he had learned as an arc embedded deep in his mind. Finally, it came back in spurts. Tudanda Estoy proclaimed the healer told him he had been brought to Oaxaca and that he had an envelope waiting for him on the desk. Kurt arose groggily from the floor, reaching for the file. It was filled with deportation documents and files proclaiming his Mexican citizenship. He had planned on retiring in Oaxaca when the time was right. Someone was looking after him. He scanned further through the documents. Finally, through it, finally a cassette tape was found deep in the envelope. Kurt scanned the room and found the tape deck. He plugged it in, process, pre- pressing play. If you are hearing this, then you should take the solace in the fact that we spared your life. I have been following you since the eighties, nephew. You do not resent me. You came to me. You came to know too much, too much that the government is willing to admit to. If you look further in your papers, you will find evidence of your funeral. It was said you drowned in the Columbia River after a night of heavy drinking. Hector will care for you and help introduce you to community. His family in the U.S. are my neighbors. The Matas, you recall. You can trust him. He is a healer. Take care, Kurt. Godspeed and trust no one. Furthermore, I know you must be confused about the ITS and their execution of Clayton the night of your capture. He was writing a book, agents raiding his home, and a large collection of micro cassettes and a daily log going back five years. He was working for the Chinese government. Perhaps you're wondering why I gave up on you. I need you to know that I saved you from an extraordinary rendition and likely death. Horus is my archangel, and you are the bridge between us. Laid these memories to the wind, nephew. Love, Creighton. One thing was missing, Michelle. What other woman would wash his hair and stick him into the depths and stick by him into the depths of hell. His lighthouse, his lighthouse in the rasp of the fog. Looking through the more of his belongings, he was thrown off by his own personal copy of the Dhammapada sitting on top of a book by Thich Nhat Khan. There was a note on the book which read, went out on some errands. See you soon, Mich- XOXO Michelle. Kurt felt soothed immediately. Luckily, there was a six-pack of Modelo Special and pre-treated chilada cups, limes, and fruit bowl. Hector had left, and Kurt sat in silence, grateful to be alive. Finally, he heard a low growl of a truck out front, and he rose to his feet, the beer thundering through his heart in the, in the, in the heat. There she was, smiling ear to ear with her Seahawks hat. The two embraced, laughing at the fact that the Junker F-150 had a shattered back windshield equipped with a Megadeth bumper sticker. This, this is what he had longed for, the muggy hot Pacific air surrounded by wonderful souls in Chicantanas sold at the market in the ounce, Chicantanas sold at the market in the ounce, iguana egg tacos, salty wind swirling through the washed clothes in the yard, barbecued tilapia. Uh, before he had left, Hector had given him a small dose of peyote and a spare button, a bag filled with mushrooms. As the peyote swallowed his mind and heart, Realizing in that instant he had lived a life of pain, suicidal ideation, the loss of many friends, some who had looked up to by devoured by guilt and drinking away the pain. 
For the first time in his entire life, he felt free of pain. He stared long into the Michelle's eyes, remarking, There's a whole universe in there. He kissed her on her forehead, wrapping his arms around her frail body. He joked, We gotta fatten you up. They made their way down to the beach to bathe in the salt water as Hector had instructed. Slowly the sun began to fall, and the cicadas began to awaken, followed by the grasshoppers. They built a small tiny fire, smiling at, smiling at passers-by who returned their greetings with their own. Kurt felt light, light years away from Seattle and Olympia, the hell of Aberdeen falling away into the dying sun. And so they sat there just like that. Their souls were connected, their hearts at peace, euphoria abound. The Evil Late Show Nightly by John S. Argusinger. In ourself lies the whole world, and if you don't know how to look and learn, the door is there, and the key is in your hand. Nobody on earth can give you either the key or the door to open, except yourself. Jiddu Krishnamaritu. Krishnamariti, I don't know why I quoted that guy. John Hargett Singer, Sunday, May 2nd, 2021, 948 p.m. Anchorage, Alaska. That's the date it was finished. Thanks for listening.